thank you so much for that, both Mike and Jillian. Jillian, if you could uh, come back with your video, um, we'll have questions for 10 minutes. I know we're running uh, 10 minutes late, everyone, but um, unfortunately, uh, Kelsey, who's at the end, has um, can't manage to make it. So we do have an additional 15 minutes um, with us. Uh, one of the main one of the questions that I wanted to ask was, um, well, we haven't really mentioned COVID this morning and uh, how nations are responding to um, by by putting basically culture and heritage under threat, or at least the, the, the sector certainly feels threatened and it's at the bottom of the list. But of course, at the same time, infrastructure and land use is a key resource for boosting the economy, particularly through new infrastructure pro, uh, projects and housing and so on. So um, I wanted to ask first, Gillian, uh, so how can this idea of the circular economy work within this context that we're seeing in Europe? And Mike, um, thinking about the build, build, build rhetoric that we're seeing from this government, where do you think uh, we're likely to head in this um, climate moving forward and thinking about significance? I would say that uh, certainly a building that is being retrofitted or rehabbed uh, whether it be a building that is cultural heritage or not, uh, in general, if what you're asking about is governmental plans to increase employment after uh, COVID, yes, they are more um, a rehabilitation, uh, particularly with reclamation of building parts and components that is a more uh, labor intensive process and I I would assume that if uh, the point is to employ more people then uh, rehabilitation um, particularly with reclamation uh, and reuse would be uh, attractive to such government uh, initiatives mm -hmm. okay and Mike yeah, thanks, Hannah. From my perspective, thanks, Julian. From my perspective, where we were pre the pandemic, there was government. The government was moving towards something it called the, the called the Building Beautiful Commission, whereby they were looking at improving the quality of design in the environment, in in the built environment as well. That there's the environment bill coming through to Parliament, which was being worked on beforehand, which includes biodiversity calculations, which colleagues have mentioned earlier. And there's also big debate about the VAT being changed. And of course, the pandemic's come, and there appears to be a reappraisal of values. And for example, our colleagues this morning in historic England will be part of spending round that governments go through and the work that they're doing is not only exemplary but it allows them to make a case because in my I started working in this sector in the year 2000 so 20 years ago we were making the case for funding for the, the meaning of the value of heritage there was a government white paper in 2001 which was then called the power of place the government have always been aware of the value of the heritage sector the question is how much, if you like crudely, cash they're putting into it to then generate other value. So having people at the top table pushing that agenda is fundamental from an evidence base, from a research base, but also from some values. And now we have a climate crisis as well when we come out of the current situation. And the climate crisis uh, will have huge effects on her heritage buildings as well and that government, one hopes, would be alert to it. So the build, build, build mantra that I noted, you mentioned in the question, one hopes is a soundbite, but might not actually be the detail of policy when that policy ca came through. Uh, just two days ago, the DEFRA minister, the uh, Food Rural Affairs Minister for England, made an announcement on small amounts of extra funding, not much, I think it's about £5 million pounds here or there, um, but it's a start, and one hopes that there'll be more of this coming through um, and, and not less. So I'm 
hoping that build, build, build is purely a, a bit of a sound bite and that other things happen. Thank you. I would like to say that the, the link that you just made between uh, climate impact and build, build, build is critical. It's really incredibly important. Um, and that should spur, again, reuse of buildings of all kinds rather than simply rebuilding or extracting more materials and resources for new buildings. Um, yeah. That's, yeah. We've all pointed out there's quite uh, a, a large environmental impact of all buildings. So it's mm -hmm. an opportunity with uh, refurbishment and rehabilitation to uh, increase energy efficiency uh, as well. So I would I would hope that in policy those uh, criteria are considered. Yes, I very much agree on that, Gillian, because if the UK, for example, was to meet this 2050 target, they would have to retrofit, I think it's something like 25 million dwellings would have to be retrofitted on energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. So to demolish buildings, to simply rebuild them, is intrinsically the wrong thing to do. The carbon life cycle matter has to get more preeminence. I, I completely agree. Thank you. Any, any, um, if any of the previous uh, panelists have any comments to make, please do um, come in. Uh, I was actually wondering about, um, oh, Adala? Yeah. Um, can I just add to this? I think this is, is really important. And also going back to Susan Ashley's question, which I don't think we responded to. I think we need to, in terms of policy, we really need to consider the types of conversation and the language that is being had. And this is why we're really keen to push the economic side of things, which I think within the heritage sector, we've been quite weak at and it is to our own detriment. One of the things we did in our Heritage Counts research last year was looking at the life cycle, um, at a life cycle assessment of historic buildings and showing the importance of actually counting all aspects of carbon emissions within the built historic environment. Because what we were finding is we're missing, in the way we, the current systems and languages are progressing, is we're missing up to a third of carbon emissions that result from new buildings that is already embodied. So we looked at um, the carbon in a building before retrofit, a carbon in a historic building after retrofit, and looked at a hypothetical scenario where you replace that building with a new development. And what we found is there is so much carbon that's already embodied in what is already here. And we know there are lots of uh, different ways of cutting the data, but pretty much 80% of the buildings that will exist in 2050 where we need to be uh, at zero carbon exist today. A lot of the science, a lot of the innovation, a lot of the discussion around the um, improving our buildings is focused on new, whereas this huge chunk of existing infrastructure is um, sort of an afterthought, which is where we then kind of apply what we know from new buildings to old buildings, which isn't really the right way we should be doing it. We should be actually looking at what we already have here. A lot of our historic buildings were built in a really carbon neutral way um, were built to breathe and were, were not built to, um, we, it's not easy to apply new um, building techniques to old buildings. And it doesn't mean that they're less efficient or less, um, or emit more carbon. It's just we need to invest a little bit more in understanding those existing buildings and, and bringing them into this debate as well. They're not problems, they're actually solutions in many cases. Agreed. I would also add to that that um, many cultural heritage buildings are built with traditional and local materials. So they are inherently low carbon alternatives uh, in terms of the materials in wood and stone, etc. That is in addition uh, to the existing embodied car carbon. So a re rehabilitation and uh, refurbishment using traditional and local materials would 
almost inherently be a more low-carbon alternative. And, and Gillian, I'm delighted you use the word yes. traditional buildings because heritage buildings and traditional buildings can be different. You yes. can have a traditional building that isn't necessarily a preserved building, and there's Absolutely. going to be more traditional buildings, isn't there? So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And also, one of the things that we did, we can show is that you have buildings that are 900 years old in this country that are still standing, that are still in active use. Mm -hmm. We really, really encourage a, a, a regime of repairing and maintaining. And this is where we have said the current VAT system is, is an unfair playing field because we really think we should be encouraging um, through fiscal means as well as other means the constant repair and maintenance of our buildings because if we do that we will end up using less resources things will last lo longer if yes. we think of some traditional structures and um i use as an oak beam that was um in a building 900 years ago is very different to the ones we're starting to use today so there is something about the durability and the potential durability of materials used in old buildings and very much about local supply chains looking more locally because we know one of the government's agendas in, in post-COVID is to increase local economic development, local economic growth and this is also a means of achieving um, other policy goals as well as for us in encouraging improved uh, use and durability of the heritage of the historic environment. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? We have a lot of preaching to the choir here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just was going to quickly mention um, the when we're looking at climate change impacts, of course, with more extreme rainfall, a number of heritage buildings, which are built of, for example, lime, which is a, a much more carbon efficient, neutral, relatively neutral uh, compared to cement. Um, concrete, but a number of line buildings will struggle in increased uh, moisture content over the year. And that therefore, one of the other issues that we mustn't take our eye off is what's called maladaptation, whereby the adaptation strategies are not suitable for the particular materials used in that particular building. So um, there, ha there will be an evolution of the science that's going to come through from the sector. I know that in Germany, for example, they're producing a a line technology which is more durable but is uh, suitable for historic structures so that we may find that the, the and obviously historic England will lead on this in in England um, and, and they publish a lot of scientific work already and have scientific advisors working for them but it will be that will come through as well so this concept of maladaptation -adapt is worthy of our reflection as well. Um, I'm just very conscious of time, but I just want to get one question in from um, from the audience. Uh, Steve-O asked, are there holistic aspects of old styles of building that could be incorporated into modern styles to increase durability? And if we could just answer that very quickly, because we're a little bit behind with time. I, I would say yes, that there are, that there's an evolving, and I'm, I'm not a building surveyor, I would always work with them in my career to ask their expert advice on these matters, especially Sarah, but um, there appears to be a number of evolving technologies which come from, if you like, modern science that you can use. The, the question uses the word holistic, so one assumes it could work in traditional, new and old buildings, but would be appropriate for an old building. But just that, mentioning that point about line, evolving line technology will help, but that could still be used in a, a classically new building, and it is a lower carbon technology. So there could be a, a meeting of the two sectors in this, which will be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much, Gillian. Thank you so much, Mike.